Hello and welcome to Global Questions with me, Zainab Badawi from Barbados. I'm in the capital, Bridgetown, outside Parliament, overlooking Independence Square. In November this year, Barbados marks its 55th anniversary by becoming a republic. Queen Elizabeth will no longer be head of state. What does this tell us about the identity and future of Barbados and the rest of the region? The Caribbean has been very badly affected by the economic fallout of COVID and people are looking to their political leaders for solutions. That's Global Questions, Lessons from Barbados. Well, I'm now here at the 18th century George Washington House, one of the finest historic buildings in Barbados. And I'm joined by a local audience who are going to be putting their questions to their Prime Minister, the Honourable Mia Motley. And uh, Mia, I should say that you're also the Minister of Finance, Economic Affairs and Investment in Barbados, so a very busy lady. And you've had a series of career firsts. You were not only the first female Prime Minister in Barbados, you're also the first woman to have led the opposition and to have held the post of Attorney General. So a lot to live up to there. Prime Minister, welcome to you. Thank you. And to all of you. And remember, you too can join the conversation. It's hashtag BBC Global Questions. Great, thank you. So, let's get down to our first question, yes. Prime Minister, and it's from Livas Kwarisim. Livas, what do you want to ask Mia Motley? Madam Prime Minister, what is Barbados hoping to achieve when it becomes a republic? To be able to settle for our citizens once and for all that they do not and will not be inferior to anyone on this earth. We have for too long had to accept the fact that a head of state of this country is somebody who we don't choose. We have no say in how they're appointed, and it causes us to feel, in many instances, that there are two sets of people. Um, we hope to bring this to an end, and we hope that it will give the confidence and the sense of high self-esteem that our citizens need in order to be able to be more productive and in order to be able to chart our own destiny. When you look at our history and how we got here, then you realize that having a head of state who is a non-Barbadian is an anachronism that this country can no longer afford to carry. And secondly, that we use this opportunity to be able to set the tone and to create the framework for establishing once and for all who we want to be and what we want to stand for. And that requires, in my view, not just form, but substance. And to that extent, therefore, we're not only changing the head of state, we hope to be able to start a discussion for a new constitution, but a new constitution that looks at the different roles, responsibilities, and indeed um, rights of citizens. But before you even get there, I think we need to settle a document that says, look, this is who we are. This is what we stand for. And on our own journey here as a government, we did something similar in 2016 with a covenant of hope. We want to be able to let people know that nation building is not a passive act. It is very much an active entity. And if it is active, then we need to know who we are and what we stand for. All right. But you know, Mia Motley, there are those in Barbados who say, look, the Queen's a very benign presence. Mm -hmm. And secondly, you've just decided to do this. You haven't put this to a referendum. Well, first of all, anyone who tells you that doesn't know the history of this country. We have been discussing a republic now since the late 1990s. And the 1998 Constitutional Reform Commission um, that was led by Sir Henry Ford and was a broad civil society and um, across all political parties recommended yet again that this is the direction in which we go. We actually, I was attorney general when we looked at the issue of a referendum. And then all political parties and all other elements of civil society have more or less in the last 20 years said, this is a time that has come and that we don't need any more discussion. Um, and, and let me be very clear, 
Our determination that we want to be the best that we can be is not a reflection to denigrate anyone. And we have utmost respect for the royal family, utmost respect for Her Majesty, utmost respect for Prince Charles, who is a great friend of Barbados. But equally, we have utmost love for our people and ourselves. And when we look into the mirror, the image that we need to see is somebody who is capable of being able of rising to the top of this country's um, offices. And as a non-executive president, capable of reflecting the best of who we are and understanding what we face every day. All right, very quickly, what about the Commonwealth? Could you leave that Still, to? No, absolutely not. We believe in the Commonwealth. Um, and as you know, there are many, many African countries that are republics within the Commonwealth. And there are other Caribbean countries as well. Dominica is a, is, is a republic. Trinidad and Tobago is a republic. They're all in the Commonwealth. Um, Guyana. So that... <laughs> Regrettably, these are some of the issues. Uh, in Barbados, we would call them red herrings, that people float out there to determine whether this is a good thing or a bad thing. But we are not leaving the Commonwealth. Well, in fact, we have a question about the Commonwealth from Pierre Cook. Pierre, fire away. Going forward, will the Commonwealth still be our main international platform, or will you look for other international partners? Commonwealth will continue to be one of our key platforms. Um, in which we function. It's never been the only one. In fact, the main one for us is CARICOM, the Caribbean community. And we have determined that among ourselves within the region, we will treat to each other better and stronger than any other grouping. That is why we have the CARICOM single market and single economy. No different from the European Union, um, no different now from Africa with the Africa free trade area. Equally, we are a key member of the Organization of African, Caribbean, and Pacific States. And those are our partners across the Atlantic, across the Pacific. And those are critical, especially in today's age. Let me give you an example. We've been talking, for example, about the impact of climate on small island developing states. But we've come to the conclusion that we're not heard and we're not seen. And therefore, we're changing the narrative to between the tropics of Cancer and Capricorn, because those are the countries that are going to be affected in the climate crisis. Once we do that, our colleagues in Africa become our natural allies. Our colleagues in the Pacific become our natural allies. And to that extent, whether it is the Commonwealth or the ACP, or ACP as it is now called, or whether it is AOSIS, the Alliance of Small Island States, we will have multiple entities within which we operate, including, of course, the United Nations. The United Nations. Yes. I was going to bring up the United States because, of course, the Caribbean is America's backyard. I mean, from Cuba, close. Well, we like point. to say neighborhood because they neighborhood. get the wrong impression with backyard. Oh, all right. I'm sorry. I was using that. <laughs> yes, true. Okay. You're in America's neighborhood because at its closest yeah. point, it's only 70 kilometers from Cuba to uh, the, yeah. the United States. Um, seven military U.S. bases are here in the Caribbean. Um, but people are beginning to wonder whether you are looking further east. And we had a question on social media, Prime Minister, which says, I honestly would like to know why we in Barbados are so ingratiated with China. Why are we in so deep with China? So are you swapping one superpower for another? Well, once again, I regret that the person who asked the question doesn't know our history. In 1977, Barbados established relations with the People's Republic of China. Um, this is 44 years ago. And therefore, to suggest that we are now seeking to ingratiate ourselves with China means that you don't understand where we've come from or what we're doing. Um, any country that lives in this world today, to exist in this world, ought to have relations with every country. And China is clearly a global power. And for us not to have a relationship with China, even if we didn't have one 47 years ago, would be foolish. But you've been very complimentary about China. You had a phone conversation with President Xi mm -hmm. Jinping recently. You said this is all about strengthening the relationship with mm -hmm. China. In 2019, mm -hmm. the government signed up to the BRI, the big infrastructure project, and so on. And some people are suspicious. They think that China wants to buy the family silver. But let's put it this way. I've also been very complimentary of the Americans and the British and the Canadians. So that for me, not to be complimentary of China seems unusual. And similarly, for persons who believe that because we want to be friendly with China means that we are a pawn, tells us what they think about us in the first place. Because we are capable of being, as one our first prime minister said, friends of all and satellites of none.
But it's not just Barbados that's moving closer no. to China, it's the whole of the Caribbean. I mean, it's, it's the whole investment world. from China has gone up many folds. But so in is the, the whole world. If, if, you, if I look correctly, I think the Chinese hold a large, large percentage of assets within the United States of America and a large amount of their treasuries as well. So for you to focus on the Caribbean or Africa with China, without recognizing the role that China is playing in Europe or in the North Atlantic countries is a bit disingenuous and really reflects more that we are seen as pawns, regrettably, rather than countries with equal capacity to determine our destiny and to be part and parcel of that global conversation to fight the global issues of the day like climate and the pandemic. All right, well, that's put me in my place, hasn't no, it? No, not at Prime all, Minister <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Not at all, my dear. <laughs> That's all right. Thank you. We'll go to our next question. Provide me with a bit of relief. Thank you. Uh, Kevon Henry, your question, please. Yes. Uh, Prime Minister, you've added your voice to the global discussion on reparations. Uh, we could agree that reparations are due to African descendants and to their nation states. How do you view what mechanisms should be used in handling the issue of reparations? Well, let us start from the perspective that reparations for us is not a Barbadian issue alone. This is a CARICOM issue, and there's a 10-point CARICOM plan. Um, Barbados, and I at this moment happen to be the Prime Minister, has responsibility, lead responsibility for reparations in CARICOM. I'm not surprised because we were that country where the modern expression of racism took form, regrettably, in the 17th century and in the 18th century. Because as see with Barbados was the first British slave right. society. And, and a lot of the laws and a lot of the iniquitous practices came out of in here. Um, and that's why you've heard me say that while our parliament has had unbroken service, that we have both seen it as an instrument of oppression, but it is now a tool of empowerment in the last 80 or so years. So we start from that perspective. Reparations for us is a development issue. And it is one, we believe, whose time has come. 20 years ago, when we first started having this discussion, people would laugh us out of the room. When emancipation came, there was a compensation of slave owners of 20 million pounds. We ask ourselves today, when these countries became independent, what was the development compact given to us? We got no development compact to help us with housing or education or health. But all of the wealth that was extracted from these countries for centuries were used to build the monumental edifices that we see all across Europe and North America. When the British were asked for compensation, like the slave owners were, they were told, your freedom is your compensation. And, and that, once How about that? that once again is an offhand comment that causes us to feel that you think we're pawns and not human beings. And we say simply, look, we're not seeking to do anything that is unusual but we believe that our people have a right to development. And therefore, we feel that there is need for a conversation, particularly for the developing countries of the world who were made victims for centuries of the extraction of wealth on a continuous basis. Let's go um, to Ian Melville now, who wants to ask a question about the economy. And just before he speaks, I should say to you, Prime Minister, that Guy Hewitt from the opposition here in Barbados says, all this talk about the Republic and so on is just a convenient distraction from COVID and the economic crisis. Well, a man, a man who served as British High Commission, Barbados' High Commission to the UK, and whose sole claim to fame is that, would say so about a republic. All right. So I don't have a difficulty okay, with that. Okay, but he says it's a, a distraction from the economic crisis here. So let's hear about the economic crisis. Thank you. Ian Melville. Good afternoon, Prime Minister. How are you, sir? Very well. A year or so ago, you announced a grouping of individuals who would get together to look for new ideas and new directions for our economy. Since then, it seems to be very quiet. So where are we in this subject, in the public domain, not just what you've heard? We're still planning very much on it, um, on renewable energy. We've just, for example, gotten a major study completed that looks at the issue of offshore wind energy that would see a billion US dollars in investment that would help us meet the 2030 targets. With respect to tourism, the Minister of Tourism is here, and she will tell you COVID, 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 COVID. Um, and, and the bottom line is that even as we have started to reopen, we look at the performance figures of all tourism and travel dependent economies last year. The only countries that did as bad or worse than us were war torn countries, Libya and Lebanon. Collectively, the impact has been horrific because when you then start to look at the reduced demand for food 
and reduce demand for goods and services across the board, you then see other parts of the economy suffering. But you're laying all the problems at the door of the COVID crisis and the impact it's had on tourism, which true, obviously, has decimated it here. But you know for a long time, Prime Minister, they've been talking in Barbados about diversifying the economy. And I'm coming to that. 40% of your GDP is from tourism, to that. which is much higher than the average for the whole Caribbean region, which is about 17%. 40% of your jobs are on tourism. You've known this for a long time. You need to diversify. Well, and, and that's exactly what we're trying to do. Now, remember, I've inherited a government that for 40, 50 years, people talked about diversification. But as usual, it is when the woman turns up, she has to do the job. So <laughs> let's, let's get to it. Barbados will never be able to compete with high volume, low value manufacturing. But we need to go after high value manufacturing and we need to go after research. But you need gone. to grow what you eat. I mean, the well, food import bit. You're coming to everything when I say it, but I just kind of brought you. 80% yeah. of the food consumed yeah. in Barbados is imported. And, and you need to produce what you consume. And, and, and that's exactly what we've been doing. But you can't produce food without water. So what have we been doing? The government has spent just under $10 million doing a series of dams across the country so that what we are responding to first and foremost is correcting decades of, 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 of ignoring the critical aspects that are necessary in order to increase food production. We've had some interruptions. The worst ash fall, sorry, in 119 years and the worst hurricane in 66. I would flat. call it a... Yeah. a, 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 a Triple whammy. A, a trifecta. Yeah, okay. So you need to cut your Prime Minister... We're, we're slack. right opposite the garrison savannah oh, where okay. horses run. So I'll call it the trifecta. All right, that will do. <laughs> Thank you. Let's go to our next question. Rianne Prescott, your question, please, to Mia Motley. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Prime Minister Mia Motley, what measures would you put in place to help with youth unemployment? Absolutely a good question. Let's just give the figure out there. It's about 32% yeah. as opposed to the national average of 17%. Yeah, the national average is about 17.5%. Yeah. must be the first time a politician goes up rather than down. But 17.5%. Okay. So, look, one of the great problems that we have now is being able to find jobs across the board. And because of the implosion in the private economy in particular, what we're doing is trying to run a counter-cyclical fiscal deficit. In other words, a lot of fancy language for the fact that government is going to have to step in and create the projects in order to be able to allow persons to go forward. We also recognize that Barbados is simply a hub on this globe. And therefore, we're not looking only to the economic activity within Barbados to create opportunities for our young people to get work. And it is to that extent, training and retraining becomes absolutely critical, education and training. So the first thing we did as a government was to reintroduce free education at the tertiary level for our young people. Because without those skills, they would simply be hewers of wood and drawers of water. That's not who we want. We want our young people to be able to do work in Africa, to do work in Europe, to do work from anywhere, both from here or if they have to travel. Similarly, we recognize that, as I said, tourism alone is not going to do it. Yeah. And our young people with technology and capital will be at the forefront of agriculture and will be at the forefront of the digital economy and the creation of apps and other things that can help a wider population base than the 300,000 we have here or the base that we have within CARICOM. Uh, let's go to our next question, please. Tyrrell Giles, what do you want to ask? Hi, uh, good afternoon, Prime Minister. Good afternoon. Um, first, I just wanted to say thank you publicly because I am a beneficiary of the free education and one of the contractual jobs that you've created for young people. So I wanted to publicly thank you for that. Thank you. and, uh, you've got a lot of fans here today, <laughs> Prime Minister. Uh, my question today is about climate change, however, though. Um, how big a risk do you see climate change as to Barbados and the region? And how do you see your policies and plans positively affecting us in the next five to ten years or so? Look, it is huge, and let us not delude ourselves. Um, we see it and feel it all the time. And, and I call the drought and the sargassum the chronic NCDs of climate. That's a sargassum seaweed, sargassum which is seaweed. washing up. It's very, right. very smelly, and it's really all toxic. over your... Toxic. It's toxic. Although, ironically, it allows, I'm told, the sea, sea, sea grass to grow better and the sea urchins right. and other but things But it's not good back. for the ecosystem no. and the it's, marine It's not life. good, certainly, for right. those who live on the coast, 
or do their business on the coast. Because you've got about 50% of your population is coastal. That's right. I think the average across the Caribbean is about 70%. That's right. And that's why I've also established a Ministry of Maritime Affairs and Blue Economy, because our maritime jurisdiction is 424 times the size of our land, and we need to manage both. And we're, natural disasters are a big issue for the whole of the Caribbean well, That's what I was coming to, yeah. because the chronic NCDs are really the droughts and the sargassum seaweed, and those things that hit us every day, every day, every day. And then the hurricanes are what catches the BBC's attention, because that's a heart attack, and it comes at you. But the point I'm making is that we fight in this daily. This is not something that just comes in the middle of summer, um, as, as do the wildfires in California, or as do the floods in Europe. We're literally fighting this daily. And regrettably, the world came together in Paris and said, look, we're going to put some financing together to be able to help people with resilience and adaptation, etc." It has not happened. I am hopeful that the United Kingdom, at um, leading the whole effort in Glasgow, will start to make a difference in terms of access to financing with respect to how we build adaptation, deal with adaptation and resilience in climate. At the same time, I'm hopeful that a lot of young people will get jobs because there has to be an adjustment of how we build and what we do to prepare ourselves for these new areas of activity that are on the front line because of the crisis. That's why water is an issue in the country, and that's why food security is an issue that has to be resolved in how we settle, how we're going to augment our water supply. Tyrrell. I can go on and on, but I'll stop I know here. you could, but we haven't got time. So, yep. Tyrrell, thank you. Hi. Yes, ma'am. Thank you for answering the question. Um, just one follow-up. I know we have a lot of advocates, youth advocates. Um, we have, have av health advocates, sorry. We have gender advocates. And I just think that it's about time that we, as a government, as a people, as a nation, strengthen our climate change advocates. I take your point. Is that and, a good idea? I, it is. And I, I mean, we have at the very high formal levels, but where we need it now is for it to become mass-based so that the average young person will feel right. that this is a matter that bothers and affects them. Okay. Tyrrell, it sounds like the Prime Minister likes your idea. You can I will. Chat, you can have a chat with her later, maybe. Put yourself forward. You can volunteer. <laughs> Final question, please, from Rene Holden McLean Ramirez. <laughs> good afternoon, Prime Minister. Um, you mentioned the constitution earlier, so my question is if the republic, the new republic constitution will be amended to include human rights laws, as well, clauses, sorry, as well as the removal of discriminatory laws, um, laws that affect marginalized people like the disabled, LGBTQ persons and homeless persons. Well, you've asked a lot of questions in one, so let me answer you. One, there will be a new constitution for Barbados that will be the product of discussion. It will be the first order of business for a new Barbados post 30th of November of this year. Before that, we hope to be able, as I said, to settle who we are and what we stand for. And the government has already made it clear that a country that has known what it is to be a victim of discrimination in so many ways cannot perpetuate discrimination in any way. And we've already said that whether it is related to civil partnership laws that will allow people to be able to have access to the rights and protection of the law simply because of who they love. Secondly, with respect to the issue of um, other human rights abuses, Barbados' constitution covers a lot of it. Where there are gaps, there will be conversations with the country from St. Lucie to St. Philip because we have a framework of a social partnership that brings together government, brings together labor, private sector, and we have a social justice committee that this government established that brings together civil society because we are conscious that we don't only govern for ourselves individually as a government, but we govern for a nation, and conversation and progress is based on what we can therefore agree upon as a nation. Um, and, and there are some things that will be driven by the international agenda because if we don't do it, we will be excluded. And some of them will require, therefore, that level of deep conversation as we go forward. OK, well, that's a good point to uh, end this programme then, because uh, some people do say the Caribbean as a region perhaps is lacking in uh, inclusive rights for um, all groups. I, I'm um, not of so society. sure. And I think that the world has to begin to also have some cultural discussions 
because democracy doesn't only come in one flavor. It may have universal values, but the same way my accent is different from yours and it's different from his, yeah. that the world does admit of diversity. And we have to have sensible, mature conversations that can't be reduced to 60-second um, song bites or to headlines. And that's where I think the world is missing that kind of mature discussion and certainly does not see small island states regrettably. Well, thank you very much indeed, Prime Minister. You've given us a flavour there of what you're trying to achieve here in Barbados. Thank you so much as well. Thank you. So um, the Honourable Prime Minister of Barbados, Mia Motley, and thank you to my audience here. That's all from this edition of Global Questions, Lessons from Barbados. It's been my pleasure being with you outside George Washington House here in Bridgetown, Barbados. We'll be back with another edition of Global Questions from here in Barbados. This time we'll be focusing on the Caribbean and climate change. So till then, from me, Zainab Badawi, and the rest of the Global Questions team, goodbye.